Today, the Lord has put a message on my heart from a scripture that has not left me alone in four weeks. This scripture and this story has absolutely captivated my heart. And I believe the Lord has encouraged you today on recognizing and living in the presence of God. So if you would pray with me, I want to ask a blessing on the word of God and we'll dive right in. Father, we thank you for your goodness this morning. And we know that we had the opportunity to worship you with a sacrifice of praise and musical worship. We thank you that our creative talents that you have given our people, we are able to give a reminder of thanksgiving. We thank you, Father, that we can worship you in giving. We can worship you in, in shouts of praise. But what an honor we have right now, God, to open up your holy word, the very written voice of God, to be encouraged. And I pray that's exactly what you do for my friends here today. May you speak to every heart, Lord. May you encourage every soul here today. May you continue to do your work of healing and restoration and transformation in our lives as we look to you and we look to the word of God. Go before us now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Well, about 12 years ago, uh, my family and I, we were very blessed. We had a, a wonderful job as, as an associate pastor. And the Lord blessed us miraculously in Southern California with a townhouse. So we had our, we were homeowners for the very first time and it was a bank owned property. So everything needed updating and we had a pastor salary. So we couldn't do that for a while. Well, finally we had the funds and we were able to give a little bit of a facelift. So we put in all brand new flooring downstairs and we were able to upgrade our kitchen to all stainless steel appliances. And that was incredible for me because my oven didn't work the entire time we lived there. Everything was from the 80s. It was, you know, a little bit sketchy, you know, some of our appliances. We didn't have an ice machine. So when we got all of our new appliances, every time I got something cold to drink, I told my wife, remember when we didn't have ice? <laughs> or I pulled something out of the oven. Remember when we couldn't do this? And just constantly celebrating God. Well, as a pastor, one thing I do, if, if I ever need work at the church or work at my home, I always look to my congregation first to see if there's anybody who can do the work before I go and give my business to somebody else. So there were two people in my church that could help me out. One of them was a church planter. He installed floors for a living in his day job. So I brought him on for the job. And, and then I also had my lead usher and greeter. Uh, he worked at a baseboard and molding warehouse. So of course he gave me a great discount and, and uh, gave me a great selection. And both of my friends, both of my friends, they gave me the exact same advice. They said, Rudy, don't you dare put those baseboards in before you paint them. Paint your baseboards before you install them. Both my friends gave me this advice. Do you think I took their advice? Oh, you guys trust me so much. No, I didn't. <laughs> Absolutely did not. I was lazy. They installed it. It looked beautiful, but you could see all the nails. You could see all the smudges. And I said, what have I done? <laughs> Finally, after two years. I, I got the energy and the time to get on my hands and knees for days, along with my puppy, who had several bits of paint on her. And I went and painted the baseboards and it was laborious. It was tiresome. It, I, I was sore for days to come, all because I didn't listen to my friends. Now, why in the world is this preacher talking about an insignificant story of baseboards from 12 years ago? <laughs> Simply to set the tone and to set the stage for what I want to say today, that sometimes we make life way harder than it has to be in multiple different ways. Sometimes we make life harder than it has to be because of our dumb decisions. I know we're so quick to say, oh, the devil's attacking me. Or maybe you're just dumb. <laughs> maybe you made a bad decision. Maybe you shouldn't have dated that person. Maybe you shouldn't have gone to the club. Maybe you shouldn't have done drugs. I mean, come on now. <laughs> Sometimes it's just a bad decision, but sometimes we do things that make life so much harder. Going further than that, Christians who are saved by the blood of the lamb, filled with the Holy Spirit, connected to the Father in heaven, we declare so negatively over our lives that everything is so darn hard. We say life is hard, marriage is hard, raising teenagers is hard, resisting temptation is hard, everything is so difficult, there's trials, there's trials and circumstances everywhere that we go. And we declare in not the, the great presence of God, we declare not with great authority in Jesus, we declare negatively 
and complaining that life is too hard. But let me just declare that maybe all of those things are difficult because we're doing them without God. We're doing them outside of the presence of God. Now, let me clarify. When I say presence of God, I'm not talking about his omnipresence. His omnipresence is everywhere. There's no place we can escape the presence of God. Even if you are a Christian who sins and messes up and makes mistakes, you still cannot escape the presence of God. I'm not talking about his omnipresence. I'm talking about his Shekinah glory. I'm talking about the glory of God. I'm talking about his manifest presence. The difference between the manifest and omnipresence of God is that the manifest presence of God is where you can really experience him in your mind, soul, and body, your emotions, your experiences. Everybody is aware that something happened. When we leave church and we say, whoa, the spirit really moved in that service, what we're really saying is that his spirit, his manifest spirit, his manifest presence was overflowing in that place. We had an encounter with the glory of God. And everything that we want, everything that we need is found in the presence of God. And it's so funny that though we know that God holds everything that we could ever want, even though we understand that everything we need is, is found in him, we still look to our own strengths. We still try to figure it out on our own and we still make God a last resort. I hate that, that phrase that says, well, all I can do is pray. Basically, what you said is I've tried everything else and now as a last resort, I'm going to pray. Prayer should be your first priority, not your last resort. Jesus take the wheel is a very great statement to say. <laughs> so in this last few weeks, uh, the scripture that God has been burning on my heart has been in Genesis chapter 28. It's the story of Jacob discovering, discovering that the presence of God was there all along. And he says this statement that is so scary that is so dangerous that the Christians can say, and that is God was here and I didn't even know. So I want to share this familiar story and teach a few things out of it. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Genesis chapter 28. And we're going to start in verse 10, reading about nine verses here today. We should all be familiar with the story, but there's a few things I want to highlight as we speak about how to enter into God's presence. Verse 10. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went to Haran. And he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. And I've mentioned this several times. Stone in the Bible, rock in the Bible often represents Jesus. So he came to a certain place. He rested upon Jesus and he was able to sleep and to see clearly. When you finally rest in Jesus, you can see clearly. So in verse 12, he had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham and the God of Isaac and the land which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants, your descendants. And these are all promises God is giving to him. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and the east and the north and the south. And you and your descendants shall be all the families of the earth and will be blessed. Behold, I am with you. Another promise of his presence. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. Let me pause right there. My greatest hope for Southgate Fellowship, this church, this house of God, is that when people say, come to my church, it's not because we're a great people or, or it's an awesome church. I want people to say, surely the Lord is in that place. God is there. God is doing something and you have to be a part of what's going on. So he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. That's the danger. There is somehow, some way as children of God, that his presence can be right there in our face and somehow we don't recognize it. It is my foremost prayer. God, when you are moving, God, when you are speaking, help me not to miss it. And in fact, that's the title of today's message. Don't miss it. Don't miss the presence of God when he is moving. Verse 17, he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. 
So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. And he called that name the place Bethel. However, previously, the name of the city had been Luz. So there's a lot happening in the scripture. First, I, I recognized that, that Jacob here, he got a promise from God, he got a promotion from God, and he was given the presence of God. And all three of those things are promised to us today. God has something for our lives. He has called us to something unique. There's a will of God for your life that is unique and to you only. But then he's given us promises, blessing. He's also said, my presence, I will go with you. I will be with you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. He told him, you're going to be the patriarch and, and your descendants are going to be more than the sand that is out there, more than the dust of the earth. You're going to inhabit the entire earth from this promise that he has given. And Jacob says, wow, how awesome is this place? And I know we like to use that word, awesome. We'll say, God, you're awesome, but we'll say our turkey was awesome. We'll say, God, you're awesome, but man, that movie was awesome. Did you know that in the Jewish culture, the Jews would never use the word awesome if it wasn't in response to God. They would only use that word awesome for God because it was that powerful. They wouldn't use it for anything else. So here, Jacob says, how awesome is this place? It is the house of God. Then he changes the name. The name used to be Luz, which in that time, that word Luz meant almond tree. And he changed it to Bethel, which means house of God. Almond tree, uh, house of God. Why is that even important? Well, first of all, almond trees are pretty cool. <laughs> They're pretty interesting. So they actually flower and blossom in the wintertime. And you get these beautiful snowflake looking flowers and these naked branches. It looks like the tree should be dead, but you got these beautiful white flowers and they, they resemble that and they associate that almond tree with old age and the end of an era. So almonds are known as the, the end of something or old age. So he says, I found that the presence of God is here. No longer is it the end of something, but it's only the beginning of something. So this can no longer just be what we've always done. It can no longer be things that are old and have passed away. It is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. And he declared over that city that this is a resting place for the presence of God. And not only was that place, Bethel, called the house of God, but thanks to Jesus, you and I are a house of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says that you and I, our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We house the presence of God. Wherever you go, you're carrying the presence of God with you. That's why you can ruin a haunted house. That's why when you step into somebody who is possessed by the demon and their head is spinning and pea soup is flying out everywhere, you just bringing the presence of God in silences enemies, silences the critics, because we are carriers of the presence. We ourselves are a house of God. But what's interesting is that the Old Testament, again, is Jesus concealed. New Testament, Jesus revealed. So you don't have to turn there, but I want to read to you real quick, and it should be up here in our, in our screens. This is John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And I want you to notice what Jesus says to Nathaniel here, what he declares about himself and how it relates to what we just read in Genesis. So in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 48, Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered and said to him, because I said that you saw, that I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So I believe that Jacob was actually seeing a messianic prophetic picture of what was to come. He saw the heavens open and angels ascending and descending, earth as it is in heaven. But the reality is that ladder has a name and that ladder's name is Jesus. Because Jesus was the way. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the one that opened the heavens and brought us back to right relationship with the Father. And now we can reality of heaven become a reality here in this world. No longer are we separated from the presence of God. 
Now we can actually step into the presence of God easily. Hebrews tells us that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Now, this is so random to say in a, uh, in a sermon, but on January 6, 2021, we had the attack on the Capitol. And whether you believe it was an actually an attack or you have a conspiracy, conspiracy theory, that's all right. Um, but one thing I could not get over on the attack of the Capitol, one thing I couldn't get over was why was it so easy? How did they get in that easily? The most important place in the government, the capital of the United States of America, shouldn't have there been technology we only see it in the, in the movies to, to protect and to, to guard? But no, these weirdos with weird stuff on just walked right in like nothing ever happened. And why do I say that? Because we, we think somehow that the presence of God is so guarded. We think that the presence of God is so hard to get into. We think that the presence of God is something earned only for the anointed ones in the church, only for the leaders of the church. The people who have real deep encounters with the presence of God are the holier than thou's. But no, scripture tells us that because of Jesus, we can easily enter into the presence of God. It's a surrender of your will. We don't get to the presence of God with greater effort. We get to the presence of God with greater surrender. It's easy to get in the presence of God. The only reason why things got hard is because of the sin. I mean, look back at the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, they ran around naked, all right? Blessed be the Lord. They ran around naked, no shame, no sorrow, no sickness, and no separation from the presence of God. They walked in the cool of the day. God is so loving that he said, when I walk with you, I won't even do it when it's hot. We're gonna do it in the cool of the day and we're gonna enjoy a nice leisurely walk together in my presence. It was perfect. The fruit just came naturally. It never rained until Noah's ark. It was just watered on its own. It was a beautiful paradise, literally heaven on earth. And somehow, some way, the devil convinced them to get something through sin that they already had in God. He said, if you bite this fruit, you take of this fruit, you will be like God. They're already like God. If you take this fruit, you will know the difference of good and evil. God's already given them his presence and, and can speak to him. So they thought that God was hiding something from them. They thought they were missing. They thought that there was more than just the presence of God, that the presence of God wasn't enough. So they sinned. And the moment they sinned, everything went from being easy and the abundance of the presence of God to difficult. Now, when they garden, there was going to be thorns. There was going to be sweat on the brow. Our entire garden ministry cannot stand this scripture here at Southgate because now gardening is hard because of Adam and Eve. <laughs> Women, you know, cramps and childbirth. You can thank Eve for that one. <laughs> Even childbearing is going to be more difficult. Everything was easy in the presence until they sinned. And the greatest news that we have now is that Jesus restored everything that Adam messed up. So even though we live in a fallen world, even though there's still sickness and sin, even though dumb people do wicked and evil things, it's still easy to get in the presence of God. And when you get in the presence of God, your marriage should be easier. Your children should be easier. Your job should be easier. Your witnessing should be easier. Your trial circumstances and temptations should be easier because you're coming from a place of divine inspiration from God. You're coming to a place of relationship with the Father, the creator of the universe, and things should flow easier. So today, I want to encourage you with how to make that easier. Use the cheesiness, but I call it CPR. CPR. And it stands for these three words. It's not on the screens, but you can, uh, you can write them down if you're taking notes. CPR stands for consistency. It stands for for purity, and it stands for relationship. So we have consistency, purity, and relationship. I believe these three things help us to be more sensitive to the presence of God and better flow in the presence of God. So consistency. I remember going to a uh, conference one time, and the, the keynote speaker said, if you ever want to be an expert in anything, simply devote 10,000 hours to that craft. So if you want to be a great musician, devote 10,000 hours. If you want to be a great communicator, devote 10,000 hours. And it's not so much about the 10,000 hours as much as it is consistent practice, consistent, perfect practice 
at your craft to make you better. And I believe that if we want to grow in the ease of walking in the presence of God, we have to be consistent. We have to be consistent. Hebrews 10, 28 says, let us hold fast to this confession of hope and not waver because he who has called us is faithful. First Corinthians 15, 58 says, be steadfast, be immovable. We have this call on our lives to be consistent. So the first step in pursuing the presence of God is being consistent in the study of his word, being consistent in prayer, being consistent in our personal time of worship. Every Sunday, we have this corporate encounter with God. We get filled up, we get inspired, we get encouraged, and we go about our week. But you and I are called every day to have our own personal encounter with God, to continue to walk in his presence, do that by staying steadfast, consistent in the disciplines. And every single discipline that we have, whether you read your Bible, you're in prayer, you're in intercession, or you're just worshiping God, every spiritual discipline should be an avenue and a tool to enter into the presence of God. I'm not reading just to get smarter at the Bible. I'm reading so I know more about him. I'm not praying just so God can bless me, bless me, bless me. I'm praying so I can know him more. I'm not worshiping because I, I want to change my life. My life has been changed by Jesus. I'm worshiping to know him better, to enter into his presence. So consistent in the spiritual disciplines that lead us into that time. And let me just say the easiest and most powerful method of entering into God's presence is the study of God's word. Just pouring yourself in the scriptures. One pastor said that when my heart is deceitful, when I'm discouraged, I will open up the Bible, read the Psalms, and I will read and read and read until I can hear my own voice in it, until he warms my heart. I think Jack Hayford used to say that. Open up the scriptures and read until the Father warms your heart. It's the easiest way that we can get into the presence of God. And sadly, there are demons who know the scriptures way more than Christians do. And here's the thing, when, when Jesus was in the wilderness and he was being tempted by the enemy, the enemy tried to do the same thing that he did to Adam. He tried to take the scriptures, which the devil knows the scriptures, Genesis to maps, he knows it. And he tried to take those scriptures and twist them to get Jesus through sin to get something that he already had in God. So he says, isn't it written, if you are the son of God, casting doubt. And three times Jesus fought back with the word of God, it is written. It is written and then finally rebuked him. But let me just say, believer of God, let me just say, Christian, let me just say, child of God, if you don't know what is written, how can you say it is written? If your heart hasn't been changed by the Holy Scriptures, if you haven't had an encounter with him, how can you go to this demon who's trying to fill your mind with lies? He's going to convince you. He's going to trick you. You can't say it is written and be like Jesus if you don't know the written word. Now, let me tell you, there's a lot of books that have been written and many that have been sold into the millions. I think the Lord of the Rings sold something like 150 million copies. And I'm not into sci-fi or fantasy like that. I don't understand it. But 150 million copies. If I were to read that book, I would need the author of that book to sit down with me and say, okay, what does this mean? What does this mean? I don't get that. Who is that? Why is he dead? Why is he back now? I don't understand. <laughs> I'd have so many questions. You know, like my wife, when we're watching a movie, she talks too much. And she, she Googles, you know, where? I seen him before and next thing you know she's googling where just watch the movie right that's how it would be with the author now 150 million copies that's only the second or third most sold book in history the first y'all know it is the bible five billion copies sold not written just sold the number one best-selling book they they can't even put the Bible on the New York best-selling list because it would win every single year. Translated into 2,000 plus languages, we have the scriptures. And you know what the best part about it is? We know the author. We know the author. And the author is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the word. He is the word made flesh, but the Holy Spirit is the author. So when you open up this beautiful book of love, you can read and if it becomes confusing, you say, Holy Spirit, speak. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Holy Spirit, I don't understand this. Holy Spirit, make this clear to me. And by you pressing in and asking those questions, you get into a greater sensitivity of what God is doing. It's our privilege to know him.
And we have to worship him, as the scriptures say, in spirit and truth. In John 4, 24, it says, he who we worship is spirit. So we must worship him in spirit and truth. So I have a little cheesy diagram for us that's going to help us to make sense of this. So media team, if you're ready, if you can put that slide up, I want to illustrate this, this progression, this sequence that we have in getting into the presence of God with his word. So we know that we're made three in one. First Thessalonians 5.23. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. We are spirit, soul, body, three in one. And there is a sequence we need to have. The Father speaks to the Son. We know this because of John 5 and John 15, that the Son of God would do nothing apart from the Father. That the Son only does what he sees the Father doing. He only says what the Father is saying. He only prays what the Father is saying. But then the Son of God, Jesus, left and said, I'm giving you the promise of the Holy Spirit. And when you worship Holy Spirit, Son, and Father, you worship in spirit and truth. Holy Spirit to our spirit. Now, again, I've used this analogy a thousand times, and I'm going to keep saying it. Our spirit is the adult in the relationship. Our soul is the hangry, moody teenager in the relationship. And our body is the toddler who just wants everything and is selfish. I know your babies are cute, but they're selfish. They don't care about your sleep. They don't care about anything but what they want. So in this relationship, we are to worship spirit to spirit, and our spirit man is supposed to declare and tell our soul what to feel, what to think, what to believe. And then our soul tells our body how to respond appropriately because our body is nothing more than a puppet. So we don't, we're not led by our emotions. We lead our emotions. And that's from spirit to spirit. God deposits revelation into our heart. We become just in, encompassed in his presence. And from that place of his presence, we align our, our soul, which is our mind, body, and spirit, and our body. We align it to be in alignment with his word. So first and foremost is consistency. I know that these disciplines are very elementary. Read the Bible, pray every day, and worship every day. Sounds simple, but never let it grow old. Don't let it go dull. We're in a relationship here. So if you're bored reading the scripture, bored praying, God's calling you to the next level. Grow in those disciplines. Don't just check it off your list. The second thing is purity. CPR, first is consistency. Next is purity. As a Christian, there is nothing you can do that'll make God love you more or make him love you less. There's nothing you can do to make God turn his back to you. Read Psalm 139. He will never leave you or forsake you. But when you sin, you're turning your back to God. When you sin, you desensitize your spirit, your soul from God. When you sin, you are now blurring the connection that you have with the Father. And although he will never leave you, we can turn our back against him. Purity is important. I believe that purity is important, not just because God told us to, but purity helps us to have the strongest connection with God. Your sins are forgiven. Anything that you've ever done has been forgiven. But your purity, your purity connect to him a whole lot better. Is this cutting out too much for you guys? You okay? We're good? I know it's driving Andrew crazy. Don't worry about it, brother. You just rest. If I cut out too much, just let me know and I'll grab a different microphone. So Matthew 5, 8, I love this. In the Beatitudes, it says, the pure in heart shall see God. The pure in heart shall see God. And then we also get to Psalm uh, 119, the longest Psalm, the longest chapter in the Bible, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By standing and staying on your word. It is your word. In Psalm 24, 3, I love this one. It says, who can ascend the hill of God? Who can come near to the Father? Only those with clean hearts and clean hands. There's something about purity that helps us to enter into God's presence more. Think, about, think of it like your relationship with your spouse. You honor your spouse. You don't cheat on your spouse. You don't abuse your spouse. You don't discredit or disarm or harm your spouse because you love them. And you want to be the best spouse you can be to them to honor and love them and your covenant you made before God and others. So you don't want to do any sin to them because you love them and your purity to your spouse helps a greater connection. So one more, one more slide. My, my fingers were very excited on graphic arts this week, but one more slide I want to show you. We've seen this triangle diagram before when it comes to marriage and connection. 
but the more sin is in your life, see that downward arrow, the more you and God seem to feel separated. Though his omnipresence is there, you feel like he's far off. You feel like he's not answering your prayers because you're so marred and blurred by your sin. But the more you can transform your mind, renew your mind, repent of your sin, walk in your righteousness, and increase your purity, the more I believe you and God get closer together. And again, not in the sense of his presence always being with us, in the sense of your awareness, your attention, and your affection to the Father. So I say, don't be pure so that you can gain more of the Father's love. He loves you. Don't be pure so that you can get blessing. He'll, he's going to bless you. Be pure because you want nothing to separate you from his presence. Be pure because you want everything that the Father has for you every single day. Purity matters. And then finally, relationship. We have consistency, purity, and relationship. Three things I believe that help us enter in better to the presence of God. Relationship. My wife and I just celebrated 18 years married last Monday, and we celebrated, which meant I did everything on her honey-do list. <laughs> We spent a lot of time together. I did projects at the church. I did projects at the house. And I did everything on her list. And praise God, it all got done right in the nick of time. And in the midst of this week, we spent a lot of time together. You know, when you spend a lot of extra time with your spouse, it's either a wonderful thing or you discover some things. And, and praise God, it was a wonderful thing. But we did get to a new revelation in our, our family. And our, our family, we're known for this. We say a phrase out of frustration or something, and it becomes a motto in our home. As an example, two years ago, we were driving to go get, um, we were driving to go get a piece of furniture we bought on Facebook Marketplace. And my wife was getting frazzled and she was trying to help, but she was being mean. She wasn't trying to be, but she was being mean. And in my frustration, I'm driving and I said, look, you think you're nice, but you're not. And it just shut the conversation down. We just started laughing. And so now when any of us, Gabriel, Nikki, or me, when, when we're being mean, we shout out, you think you're nice, right? Well, during these projects this past week, during these projects these past week, um, uh, I was, you know, working, tired, uh, doing a lot of physical activity rather than study. And I was saying nice things, but apparently I wasn't saying them the right way. So I'm like, why are you so upset? All I said was this. It's not what you said. It's how you said it. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. She's like, it's all about tone. You can say, babe, can you get me the screwdriver? Or you can say, hey, lover of my soul, honey, honey boo, would you mind at your earliest convenience? That's how Nikki wants me to talk to her, by the way. She said, it's all about your tone. So now that's what we say. When Before we get offended in our family, when somebody says something offensive, we say, tone. So now it's, you think you're nice, and tone. And it's just these funny little reminders that we've developed in our history together to help us connect better. We learned something in a moment of frustration, and now we can apply it to prevent future frustration. And I believe the same is true when it comes to the presence of God. We're not just uh, serving a master and we're his servants. We have a father and we're his sons and daughters. It's this relationship. You guys have your own personal history with God. You, as you have daily encounters with him, as you work through trials and tribulations, as you work through frustrations, as you go through tragedy, do it with the Lord. God will always bring you through. So go through. It's a joke I like to say. If you're going through hell, Keep going because <laughs> God is bringing you through and you do it with him and you develop this history in relationship with him. In your time of the presence of God, ask him questions. Learn more about him. Say, I want to experience a deeper relationship with you, God. Help me. It's the same way that the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 3, when he was just a little boy, heard the audible voice of God and he had to be trained by the priest to say, when you hear that, that's God's voice. Say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And in all the hustle and bustle of life, if we can remember that, if we can remember, speak, Lord, speak, Lord. When I'm getting upset waiting in line, when, when tragedy comes my way, 
when, when things are frustrating, when things aren't going the way I thought they would, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. He wants to encounter you in his presence. And I'll conclude with this small testimony. Got a good friend of mine who's a, an evangelist, and uh, he speaks on going deeper in the Holy Spirit, speaks on a lot of deliverance stuff. And I saw him pray for somebody. Remember how I mentioned earlier, spinning head, pea soup, somebody demonically possessed, right? Somebody was doing that at the altar, just freaking out. And the pastors didn't know what to do. All the Christian leaders didn't know what to do. And this demon was manifesting in our service to the point where it was distracting from the worship. So my friend just walked on over there. And I've seen my friend, I've seen him deliver before. And it's awesome stuff. You see like um, eyes that are dilating and they're saying, I'm going to kill you. And then he speaks a word and then they get delivered. And then an atheist will see it and then get saved. That type of stuff he does. It's awesome. So when he's stepping over to this person, I'm thinking, this is going to be a show. This is going to be awesome. You know what my friend did? He gave that demon a hug. He didn't say, I rebuke you, be gone, leave him, get out. He didn't say those things. He gave that person who was possessed or oppressed by that demon a hug. And let me tell you, that demon shrieked in pain. That all-powerful little demon could not stand love, could not stand the presence of God. When I tell you that it's our job to enter into his presence and be a house of God in everything that we do, it's far more powerful than you understand. Don't try to live your marriage out. Don't try to raise your kids. Don't try to love on your grandkids. Don't try to figure your business out. Don't try to walk in your healing apart from the presence of God. Though he will never leave you or forsake you, you can enter into greater depths of relationship and of his presence. Let me pray over you. Father, we thank you so much for who you are to us. We thank you that in our horrible mistakes of sin, you have not left us or forsaken us. You have given us hope. You have given us what mattered most to you, your dearly beloved son, to come into this world and to take our place. And now every day through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the blessing to walk in intimacy with you, to host your presence, and to look to you as the author of the word of God, as the creator of the universe, as our wonderful, loving, heavenly father, to look to you for guidance and wisdom, revelation. We thank you that we have a hope that is secure in your love. We thank you that we are not without a power and without a hope and without a boldness and a joy because of what you, Jesus, accomplished on a cross. So I declare over my friends here today and those who are watching that we would be reminded hour after hour this week of the incredible privilege we have of being in your presence. May you speak to us in a greater level. May you move in our quiet time stronger than ever. May we find this week for ourselves a sweetness in your presence. Bless my friends from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. May they go in your power, your joy, your love, and your strength as we leave this place here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. We will have some wonderful people who would love to pray for you if you're in need of further prayer. If not, have a wonderful and a wonderful blessed Thanksgiving.